appropriate to conclude our symposium, and no way could I imagine would be more appropriate to conclude it than with remarks from Vincent Scully, Emeritus Sterling Professor of the History of Art here at Yale. For over 50 years, Vincent Scully has opened our eyes to the built and natural world around us, teaching us to see forms for themselves and to recognize the ideas behind the buildings and places that constitute our world of architecture and urbanism. And he has done so much more on the lecture platform, in the studio, in the pages of his books. He has urged us to behave ethically in all we do. In times of trouble like these, he helps us to see through the circumstantial to the essential. His is the voice we hear inside as we contemplate the path to follow, as we struggle to design and behave responsibly. Vincent Scully is the conscience of architecture at Yale. Indeed, he is the conscience of architecture as so very many of us know it. Please join us in welcoming Vincent Scully. Thank you, Bob. That introduction is much too much. Um, I hardly know what to say, first of all, because it's so late. Secondly, because you heard so many interesting talks. And uh, I find that my brain is uh, seething with ideas, uh, objections, some of them, but mostly uh, interest. Uh, I don't know what to say. I mean, so much has been said. Uh, I, I, almost even after the discussion, it's only the time for the invocation, or whatever you call it, when you say, uh, bless you, my children, and everybody. Bless you. <laughs> <laughs> On the other hand, Bob told me that I was supposed to talk for an hour. <laughs> but I'm not. I'm not going to. <laughs> I'm a little sorry about that because it's been a rare pleasure for me to see you all come back and see your work and I, I wanted to be able to talk about that work today if I could but there isn't, there isn't time for that. I wish too that I could uh, comment about all the talks because they're all very interesting but there were just a couple of points I, I want to make maybe a, a couple of not exactly mistakes but first of all I want to say how, how touched I was by Aaron's talk and I knew Aaron very well when he was a student, and I didn't expect that from Aaron. And I'm very, very moved by his love, <laughs> his elegiac tone, uh, the sweet things he had to say all about all of my life. It moved me very much. He did say one thing that was untrue, but it's become a common myth. It's come up in this over and over again. It's about the burning building. I followed it from the very beginning from the day it was burning. And there was never at any time any evidence of arson, ever. But immediately in the architectural community, it began to be said that students did it. And you hear that all the time. Mouchon wrote it was last year. And of course, that helped kill Paul. As he built it to burn, but the students burned it. That break Paul's heart. And that's what he thought happened. And it's not true. It never was. The other thing is that uh, Bob Stern just parenthetically, I referred to the lipstick over here in the gallery, and he said, now it's venerated here in the gallery. It doesn't belong to the gallery. Yeah, the gallery tried to get their hands on it for years and years. It belongs to Morris College. And in, in Morris College, in Morris College it's, it can operate the way few works of art can operate in the present day. It's in the center of a culture. And it's not venerated the way things are in museums. It's cherished and derided like the ancient gods. <laughs> it lives a life over there, and we'll get it back. <laughs> the other thing is, uh, 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 Mr. Wigley's remarks, uh, were, which I, I like very much, very amusing, uh, his remark about we expect buildings to outlive us. Of course, that is so fundamental. It goes far back beyond the truth is it goes to Gilgamesh, it goes to Europe. <coughs> Because the very first cities men ever had is the city suggested immortality to human beings. How does Gilgamesh find immortality? And he, he loses it until he decides that it's only the well-fired brick that he builds deep inside the walls of the goddess Iana that, that will live beyond him. That's his immortality. And that's why, of course, the Pueblos, uh, the god of the dead, is the god of the city. Because in the city, we commune with the dead. And those are come after us. With us. And that's why, of course, it's uh, 
when a very conspicuous uh, building in our city, which we expect to uh, live us, is destroyed by enemy action, then it's not only the lives of the people who are lost in it, but the lives of all of us and the hope of future life, which is cut away. And they know it. They know what they're doing. The other thing about that is, not to go on too much about that, is I was touched the way Caesar said, Caesar's an architect and knows that the target of that plane, which those indescribably heroic people, men and women, wrestled to the ground in Pennsylvania, the target was the Capitol. Because the commentary, as you find over and over again, they keep saying, well, it was Camp David, Camp David, nonsense. It was the White House. No. Imagine if the dome of the Capitol were going right now. Imagine how we'd feel. And an architect knows that's the symbol, that's the dome. So, bless you, Caesar. <laughs> Ave, Caesar. <laughs> you understand the nature of the enemies of Rome. <laughs> so, I can't talk about a lot of the things I wanted to. The most I can say is the obvious. And it, that is, the, it's that your work is a, a good deal more varied in kind than that of any other institution I can think of. And this in the, the exhibition shows that. It runs from migrant worker housing to spaceships. But most of all, it includes a good many examples of the peculiarly Yale revival of 19th century domestic traditions and of traditional urbanism as well as a good deal of what we might call canonical modern architecture. And it's certainly not all of a, all of a piece or the product of a regimented alumni. And that, after all, is Yale's famous pluralism, for which we, and we did it over and over again, which we are constantly congratulating ourselves. <laughs> but perhaps we ought to ask ourselves if it really is a good thing. Certainly, something like it will always be desirable, indeed essential, in any department of the liberal arts, but is it for an architecture school? Perhaps a professional school should be more focused in its efforts, more categorical in its objectives. Harvard took exactly that stance in the 1940s and therefore radically redirected American architectural education, not to mention American architecture as a whole. Then, of course, as if stunned by its rightness and the totalitary the totality of its success, or simply by the rigidity of its precepts, it froze up and can hardly be said to have had a history thereafter, at least from the Yale point of view. <laughs> because Yale, lacking Harvard's dogmatic stance, and without the iconic presences of Gropius, Breuer, and the others, has had a complicated and highly productive history since that time. And especially an unexpected history. Things happened that no one expected, no one could ever have predicted. So, in the 1950s, uh, and the one that's going to be explored for us by Dean Stern in the Devane Lectures this year. The early lectures of Philip Johnson, despised at Harvard, had a markedly liberating effect here in the late 1940s. He said it was all art. That was shocking to everyone. And then, of course, in 1947 came Louis Kahn, who said he was looking for beginnings, which turned out to be far other than those imagined by Grobe. Royer. And we at Yale were willing to look for them along with him. It was so far through Kahn's search for beginnings that history came alive for us here. From the temples of Greece, of which he did some beautiful drawings, to the structure of the cathedrals in which he had been trained, and to the ruins of Rome, which were to become his most enduring inspiration. Then, closely linked to Kahn, came Venturi, who brought us back to America in his embrace of the shingle style and his respect for our urban context, to use that word. In all that, the rule of the iconoclastic Bauhaus tradition involving the presumed ideological unity of modern architecture was torn apart. And Yale's pluralism seemed to acquire a special historical sanction and probably still has it today. And have a slide. Now, this is a section I was going to leave out because of time. Uh, you've got them reversed. <laughs> left, L means left. <laughs> so the left hand, we talked about that great detail. You got them wrong. <laughs> another, 
another great thing about Yale, I tell you, you can go all over the world and nobody ever mixes the slides up. You come to Yale. <laughs> Every year they improve the rooms here so that we no longer have a hard wire connection up there, which always works. So we have one of the things, these, which works sometimes. And it's an improvement. Anyway, <laughs> we'll, we'll go out. Uh, and, but I would like to talk about what I'm going to say now for, for a few minutes because uh, some of the comments in a couple of the lectures suggest a need for it. Uh, so, for example, I talk about Yale's special historical sanction. And I say one result of it has recently touched New Haven, which was laid out, as you know, on the nine square of Akil's ideal city, under the mount, under the sacred mount in Ezekiel, according to the old pandas, uh, reconstruction of 1602, and whose fate has been shared for Yale by three, for 300 years. Out of that plan, and out of the assault upon it by the redevelopment of the 1960s, came uh, Dwayne and Clatus New Urbans, as seen at Seaside, begun in 1979, the first of many new towns and neighborhoods that the new urbanism has since created for a more or less affluent middle class. But I quickly turn to the new urbanism's, urbanism's more fundamental intention, which is a direct contradiction to a couple of statements uh, that were quoted today. It's more fundamental intention, fostered at Yale, to build low-cost, humane, low-income housing in the center of our cities, or where the dismal old projects of modernist planning once stood. And in this, Robert A.M. Stern's proposal for his subway suburb of 1976 predated Seaside by three years. You all know how on an urban site, burnt out and unwanted, but with its utilities in place, Stern proposed to build the kind of American town that most Americans, of whatever economic level, seem to want to live in, one shaped by a firm grid of streets with town green in the center. Stern threw out the high-rise slabs of the old projects that had destroyed community everywhere and have since been demolished all over the United States. And he based his houses, more or less, I hope the focus is OK, and more or less on the two and three family frontal gabled vernacular type in New Haven that Duanian and Gladys Ivory had studied a few years before. HUD never carried the scheme out but it did build a few single-family houses on the site, certainly of a less appropriate type. But they're all snapped up, and you find them like this all through the ghettos of New Haven, too, even though they lacked the supporting town plan. That was supplied by the new urbanism in its infilling urban groups of the 90s, like the central neighborhood in Cleveland by DPZ, which remade a destroyed urban neighborhood near city, city center and in this view, it seems to be very touching. It looks a lot like Stern's drawing. It was built in a local vernacular as lovingly detailed as that of Seaside. And it was supported by HUD as one of its Nehemiah neighborhoods, the predecessors of the Hope Six program initiated by the great and unjustly driven out of city life, Henry Cis uh, uh, public life, Henry Cisneros. Hope Six, as you know, attempts to reestablish the urban structure in center city sites where it has been destroyed by projects like the Horner Houses in Chicago. And here it's Peter Thalthorpe, Peter Calthorpe, who was at Yale School only one year in 1976 to 77, who reweaves an urban pattern of streets and trees and squares. And the differences are at once obvious between pure disorienting hell and perhaps not as sensitive as DPZ might have been, still a good, solid neighborhood on streets in Chicago. At a gentler scale, Ray Gindros, who taught at Yale for many years, starts in Norfolk, Virginia, with this no man's land, and transforms it into a lawn overlooked by porches. Or in Louisville, this barrack becomes a street of houses, the kind of place people can live in as individuals, citizens, and good neighbors. In fact, 
The Hope Six <coughs> program recalls and revives the most humane and effective federal intervention into low-income housing that American history can show. This was the emergency wartime housing of World War I. The government itself built a whole series of neighborhoods and industrial centers up and down the East Coast. Great care was taken to find out how the workers who were to live in them uh, wanted to live. Many of them were immigrants and had special requirements, and the government really tried very hard to accommodate that, very different from the sort of modernist idea that people should live the way architects think they should. And it was stipulated that each group would be built in the vernacular of the region. So Clouseau on the left in Jacksonville employed the wooden board and batten of the stick style and the cracker vernacular of Florida. Bridgeport, Connecticut, which was then at that time called the Essen of the United States, had seven of these neighborhoods at different scales, all of them under the general direction of John Nolan, one of the great products of the Harvard uh, Landscape Architecture School and then the Dean of American Planners. The most beautiful one was for the lowest paid workers of all, and it was called Seaside Park, which we see in both slides. It was by very good architects, not hacks or government uh, and bureaucrats, Sturgis, Shirtliff, and Hepburn, who later went on to, walk to Williamsburg to work for Rockefeller. It was in the Georgian vernacular of New England, but being built in brick had a somewhat southern air. It has the American neighborhood structure of lot, sidewalk, grass plot, trees, and street. And the image of the single family house uh, directs the, the design. It's all very low cost, so the individual houses are subdivided, this one on the right into four apartments, that was then being done at that, that time and earlier in the English Garden Cities. But each has a brave door and a fine bay window and a clear identity, and the town green is there as well. Directly after the war, there was a congressional investigation which decided that the whole program had been socialistic, un-American. And the architects of Seaside were especially reprimanded for, quote, undue elegance in design. <laughs> then, directly across the street, Iranistan Boulevard, and great Bridgeport name, another housing group was built that carefully avoided those defects. It, it dates from just before World War II. Modernism is struck, the thing is now all flat roof barracks, uh, abstractly disposed on a superblock and floating in asphalt. It has had to be rebuilt more than once and became for a long time the center of drug distribution for this section of Bridgeport. So much for those, and there are those in architecture schools too, who claim that environment has no obvious effect on human behavior. We saw that in New Haven, right enough, in that area north of the gym, ghettoized in part by the obstruction of Grove Street Cemetery. It had housing much like this on the right, along with some high rises long torn down. And to walk up there, past the cemetery, right up Ashman Street, was to feel considerable hostility, or to imagine it, which is equally destructive in the end. And indeed, many of its inhabitants, disoriented, the grid of streets was wholly destroyed, had become convinced by the way they had to live that they were a permanent underclass with little to lose. Now, though, you can wash up, walk up Ashman Street and see this, a homesick neighborhood. And you can walk there. The feeling has changed. And why would it not? The density is perhaps too low, 414 units out of the old 800 or so, and perhaps too suburban, which puts a strain on Section 8, and other programs, but compared to what it was before, it is a paradise now. The crummy high-rises are gone, and the last of the sullen low-rises are all being torn down. And when the architecture of the poor is basically of the same type as that of the rich, and is different from it not in kind but only in degree, it cannot help but encourage a kind of comradeship, a sense of community, which did not exist before. So on the left is Disney's Celebration uh, and, and Seaside Park. <coughs> Seaside Park, what, a, what an irony. The mayor, 
He is especially proud of the reestablishment of the grid of streets with the grass plots and the good masonry curb. It's a clear urban order, <coughs> worthy of the great town plan itself, and defined by the repetition of simple, uh, of a simple architectural type, like the strong and simple types that define Yale's old brick row on the green. That's what makes the city the type, the street, the trees. It's worthy, too, of the intention of the city's founders to shape a community where town and university were to work together to make a better world. That's what it is, after all. God's city under the mountain, Ezekiel's new Jerusalem, new haven of exiles, heaven on earth for all mankind to see. Now, the background of all that is in the work of this exhibition. But it also includes this exhibition, The Miracle of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, for which the principal credit that Yale can take is that it permitted Maya and her friends in the Majors program that year to make up their own course on more memorials, out of which this transcendent vision came. It's not too much to say that Maya's memorial changed the United States. It changed the way the general public thought about the veterans of Vietnam. It changed the way those veterans thought about themselves, brought them back into the American community once more. The names of the dead carved in the order in which died, they tried so hard to make it, make it alphabetical. And the reflection of ourselves in the dark stone behind them did in fact reforge in a clearly physical sense a community of the living with the dead the most remarkable thing, not likely to happen again in a hundred years. I wrote that last week. Then something else came up having to do with change in America and involving, among other things, how we perceive architecture and what it means. None of us has ever liked the World Trade Towers very much. That's really an understatement. They seem too tall and too inarticulate out of scale with the great old group of skyscrapers you see back there, uh, uh, and casting doubt not only upon their size, but, uh, but, but on the relevance of the lively urban conversation they were carrying on with each other. These did not converse. Then Caesar Pelli drew the towers into a pyramidal organization, here, something like that of the old group, but at a new scale. And they became tolerable, but still lacking in the figural life of the early skyscrapers, as seen here in 1930 in a print by Howard Cook, soaring up in the dramatic vision of the sublime. Here it's the Bank of Manhattan and the Singer Building, riding forward, pointing to the sky through the smoke, as the Woolworth and others still do today. But then the World Trade Towers were struck, and instantly their associations changed for us. They changed, charged with human pain. Their inordinate height came to seem heroic, and the void they left in their fall was wholly unbearable. It now seemed to us that they alone in New York had risen commandingly to the scale of the vast sky and into the world of the airplane, the space of the continent, and they became, in retrospect, the American sublime now irretrievably lost, leaving emptiness behind them. And how do we feel about that? Wallace Stevens, an insurance executive who worked in a high-rise in Hartford, asked us just that in a poem he called The American Sublime. It concludes that how does one feel? One grows used to the weather, the landscape, and that. And the sublime comes down to the spirit itself the spirit and space, the empty spirit in vacant space. What wine does one drink? What bread does one eat? That's where we begin.